involved since last year. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do. I'm a volcanic experimentalist, and uh, I look at how magma behaves. Where's the clicker? <laughs> um, it's a, a nice collaborative project with different universities and, and different sponsors, so I just want to give them a mention. Um, but first and foremost, I'm a magma rheologist. So a little bit about rheology. So what is rheology? Rheology is the flow and deformation of material, and I look at that in magmas. So we can have an Newtonian rheology and a non-Newtonian rheology. And Newtonian rheology is a rheology like water. It doesn't matter how fast or how, how slow I pour the water, it doesn't change its viscosity, it doesn't change any of its properties. And then we can also have a non-Newtonian rheology. In a non-Newtonian rheology, we can have a shear thinning medium and we can have a shear thickening medium. So in a shear thinning medium, uh, an example of this is tomato ketchup. If you hold a tomato ketchup bottle upside down, no tomato ketchup comes out, so you have to hit the bottom, and by adding a deformation, our ketchup thins and our viscosity decreases. Then we can also have a shear thickening magma, uh, sorry, a shear thickening material. And in this case, I've brought some silly putty along to show you how it works. Um, and if you can see, if I pull it really slowly, it flows, um, and I can do the same thing, and I can break it really quickly, and it breaks. Um, and that's a transition between a flow and then uh, a solid. I can also take that into our lab and I can smash it with a hammer. Um, I could have done it here today, but I feel it would be a bit dangerous. Um, and in this case, we actually shatter the silly putty. So we move from something that flows to something that breaks, to something that shatters. And in this case, it's because we are increasing its viscosity with increased deformation. Um, so this transition between something that flows to something that breaks can be defined with the glass transition. And the glass transition is nicely defined as the reversible transition in amorphous materials from viscous to rubbery state. Um, uh, as we go from something that's uh, like a, a, a from flowing uh, or rubbery, like our, our silly putty here, to something that's completely brittle, so like when we hit it with a hammer. Um, and that's something that people find com quite complex to understand. But Essentially, we can do that as we increase our deformation rate, like I showed you with the silly putty. Um, or we can do it with temperature. If I heated up our silly putty, you'd see that it'd start to melt. And we can also cross it by observation time. And that's something that people find really difficult to, to understand. But actually, I think Shan um, introduced it really nicely earlier with salt. So we look at the salt and we see that it's actually static in real time. But over a period of geological time, you see that that salt flows. So it, too, crosses the glass transition just with observation time. But what happens in our magmas? What is magma? Well, magma is quite a debate whether it's sheer thickening or sheer thinning and how do crystals and bubbles influence this. Um, and that's what I'm looking at now. So I'm looking at how crystals and bubbles influence this transition. And I've got a little example here of some silly putty. So this is um, some see-through silly putty that um, has had nothing done to it. And in this one, I have crystals. And you can see just over the time that I've sat them in the corner, this one um, has flown a lot less than this one. This one's far more viscous just because we had crystals. And if I pull this one, you'll see it's, it's, it's easy to break, but it's, it's quite rubbery. Whereas this one here is far more brittle. It just breaks very easily. So even just with these little... At, like analog models, you see how crystals themselves affect this transition. And why is this important? Well, this transition can help us understand how we go from this effusive eruption that produces this a-a uh, uh, lava, like the, this is examples from Hawaii this year, um, to these explosive fountains. And quite obviously, volcanoes are a threat to society. So that's why we want to study them. Um, and currently, we can predict quite well when a volcano is going to erupt. We use a lot, we've got a lot of um, seismic stations out and we can use these increased technologies to find out when a volcano is going to erupt. And we can do that quite well. But we can't determine how it's going to erupt. So, for example, um, the eruption of Mount Agung in Bali this year, 30,000 people were displaced and the volcano, for months, and the volcano erupted effusively was erupting effusively and these people were returning to their homes and they weren't observing the evacuation procedures put in place because we couldn't tell them if it was going to be an effusive eruption or explosive or when that was going to happen. 
And that's really important for these celestic magmas. So I look at lava domes, and these are celestic magmas. This is uh, um, the eruption of Mount St. Helens between 2006 and 2008, and you can see that this is a really effusive process. It's really slow, and it's relatively safe. Or you can see here, this is an, an explosion of um, Santiguito in Guatemala, and this is drone footage that we have um, from there. And I guess this is another example of how drones can be used in places where we cannot access them. So you can see the, the plume coming up here, and... Um, yeah, just how, de how, how different this transition in behaviour is. Um, and this can rapidly change. We can move from this effusive behaviour to this explosive behaviour very, very quickly. And this behaviour is determined by processes at depth. And one of those processes that changes this behaviour is that magma's rheology. So to look at the rheology of, of, of magmas, we can do different experiments. So these are an example of some of the experiments that I've carried out um, at various points in, in my degree. And we can use these experiments to tell us how magmas behave. We can also take those experiments to the synchrotron and we can look inside our samples and see how, how these crystals and these bubbles interact to give us that change in rheology. So to do that, I use a number of materials. So I use natural materials. This is an example of a andesite, sorry, a dacite from Mount Unzen. And you can see it's got a lot of crystals in it. If we look in the thin section, you see it's very complex. We have crystals, we have microlites, we have bubbles. Um, and for that reason, I also want to look at synthetic materials. So this is a synthetic material that I've made myself. It's a mix of synthetic glass, rutile crystals and sometimes olivine crystals, and those can be uh, centred, so um, we've melted them essentially with different crystal contents and we can vary the bubble content from dense, so about 0% pores to 30% pores. And these are what these look like in thin section, and you can see that they're nowhere near as complex as our, our natural magmas. And we take these into our lab and we can do some uniaxial testing. So this is um, our uniaxial machine and we put our rock in between two pistons and we perform uh, a compression in this direction. So we have a sigma one, which is our principal stress in the vertical direction. And then round that we put a furnace and that furnace can heat up to a thousand degrees. So we have a sort of magmatic shallow conduit condition. So let's just go through that. So we put our sample in between our two pistons um, and in this case, we're going to do our experiment at a strain rate of 10 to the minus 3. So this is relatively fast. We're going to heat up our sample, and we're going to deform it. And in this case, you'll see our sample breaks. And this gives us a stress-strain curve that looks like the one here on the right, where stress increases with strain. It peaks, and at that point, our sample breaks. We can also then do our experiment a little bit slower. So this is a strain rate of 10 to the minus 5. That's two orders of magnitude slower. And in this case, we, we press on our rock, and you see our, our rock flows at this point. And our stress-strain curve looks like the one on the left, where stress increases with strain, but then it plateaus. And from this, we can calculate our viscosity using the different mechanical pro properties. Um, we can also then, as I said, take these rocks to the synchrotron. And this is an example of, of one of my synthetic samples in the synchrotron. And we use digital correlation models to see how these crystals move and how they interact with each other. So what does this mean for this glass transition that I talked about before? Well, you can see some of these stress-strain curves for the Mount Unzen natural rock examples. We have the 10 to the minus 3 example, where most of our samples break. 10 to the minus 4, where we have what I term a transitional behavior, where the samples flow, but then they, they break off. And then 10 to the minus 5, where our samples just flow. So you can see that transition where we go from um, from, from our sample breaking to our sample flowing just by changing the deformation rate. So we can see this viscous brittle transition and in this case we can also see that magmas are shear thinning. Viscosity is proportional to um, our uh, peak stress so that you can see on the y-axis of these graphs our peak stress is decreasing um, of the samples as we move through strain rate. So how, how can we define this? How can we use this information to, to define when the sample fails? Well, we can use the dimensionless Debra number, and I've defined this as a failure criterion. Um, I'm not going to go through this equation, but I just wanted to, to just put it up here and show you that using these physical parameters, we can find our Debra number. And this is a plot of Debra number v's porosity. And we've got our brittle response and the 
the solid red squares, our viscous response, and the open red squares, and our transitional response in yellow. And you can see that um, our transitional response come out of a dev number about um, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4. And in current literature, uh, a dev number of greater than 10 to the minus 2 is when it's said that a melt goes under the glass transition. So when we add crystals and when we add bubbles, we're actually reducing that transition. We're moving it almost two orders of magnitude lower just by adding these particles. Um, and we also find that in these natural Unzen rocks, we see that our crystal content is pretty much constant, but we can change our porosity. So this is why I have this Devon number plotted with porosity of these Unzen samples. And you can see that the, the Devon number, as we increase porosity, actually reduces. And it follows this, this linear trend, as this, this scale here is, is logarithmic. It follows this linear trend and actually decreases as we add Add, add pores. So um, actually an, an addition of these pores is actually reducing that point of failure. Um, so the next thing is to look at how, does, how do crystals affect this, this transition. And um, to do that, I've used my synthetic samples. Um, and this is an example of some of the experiments we've done. So I just did these like last week. And the uh, stream rate was move from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 5, 4, 3, and then eventually 2, where our sample broke. And we can see here in these glass samples that as we increase our strain rate from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 2, our viscosity decreases. So again, these materials are sure thinning. Um, these are plots that I did two days ago, so I apologise, they're roughly done on Excel. Um, but what we can see here from this plot is that between 40% and 50% crystals, there's a big jump in viscosity. And that's something that um, we've sort of known for a while, that at a point where we reach a high crystal content, our crystals begin to lock up, and that's called the maximum packing fraction of those crystals. So for these samples, we found that that maximum packing fraction is somewhere in between 40 and 50% crystals. And something kind of new that I've found is that when I look at the viscosity, so that our viscosity is on the y-axis and strain rate is on the x-axis, as we increase our strain rate, this, this jump in viscosities between crystal contents actually decreases. And currently, I don't really know why that is. Um, one, one theory could be that um, at these, these slower strain rates, the, the crystals have more time to reorganize themselves and pack themselves into each other, um, where at these faster strain rates, they just don't have that time. We've also seen that um, between 0 and 10 percent, these these, these materials, they behave as Newtonian materials. We don't see a change in viscosity with strain rate. Um, and then at 20% crystals, we see a transition between this uh, non-Newtonian to, sorry, Newtonian to non-Newtonian behaviour. And then above 30% crystals, all our, all our samples behave as non-Newtonian shear thinning materials. So what does this mean? Well, we can use all our data and put... Um, particularly from Mount Unzen, and put them into stability models. This is an example of a stability model from Claire Harnett, who's a student at the University of Leeds. And she uses numerical modelling, and each of these little particles have different material properties. And we can update our, her model with our experimental results of Mount Unzen. And she has a model from, for Mount Unzen and also for, for Montserrat. So we're um, yeah, working with her. And you can find her on Twitter. Our handle is just here. It's at Claire Harnett one if you're interested. Um, and what else, well, we've also had a new formulation of this Devon number um, that we've created for these multi-phase materials. And we've moved just from, from, from a glass to something that has crystals. And this is a, a kind of old model that's been developed. It was uh, first released in 1996 and then updated in 2006. Um, and it shows what we've seen before. This is the glass transition. And this is an, uh, our temperature here and our time scale. Um, but now we can add dimensions onto this of, of pores and crystals. The great thing about the Deb number is also that it's non-dimensional. It's therefore scale independent. So we can move from the lab to the field just by using this, this, this dimensionless number. Um, and the work that we've done will help refine the accuracy of models. Um, hopefully soon we'll have a, a Debra criterion for this crystal melt uh, experiments that I've done. And maybe hopefully the next step we can also do it with bubbles. So what does this all mean for society? This is a, a video of uh, Mount Unzen erupting in Japan in 1991. Um, and essentially what the glass transition tells us is when does something flow, 
and, and behave like a, a fluid, and when does something blow and become explosive and, and react like a solid? Um, and that would help hazard mitigation entirely by, by mitigating the, the fact that we could actually um, predict how a volcano will erupt if is when a volcano will erupt. Thank you. Uh, if you do. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we've got time for a couple of questions. Again, another well done presentation. <laughs> Everything's been answered, yes. Okay. Cool. Well, if you want to play with some silly putty, you can find yeah. it. Oh, hi. Uh, well, actually, you can do some sample collection of some glassy magma, and I don't know if you've seen, uh, I think they've had it on the news, you can basically see scientists out with their hammer, and they've just basically got their hand over their face, and they just collect it, like the, the, the poor hoi hoi lava, like with their hammer. And um, so that gives like a really natural, glassy sample, and that is perfect to an option like that. It's not perfect for, for most people, but for us it's perfect because we can take something that's been unaltered and, and, and unchanged and um, collected as it's erupted. So that's something that, that we as rheologists look at. Um, but in Hawaii right now, I think the, the, one of the main things is that the, the predicting where the, the fissure is going to go, that's a big thing for us. And um, also predicting how long the eruption is going to last for, that, that's another thing that seems seemingly impossible. So it's, it's another eruption that we can use to, to fill in our database of, of data. Um, sorry, being handed the microphone made me forget my question. Oh yeah, does this does this have um, so does understanding the behaviour of the rock help you predict the timing of eruption at all, or are you just looking at which type the eruption would be? Um, so you can actually do that. You can do that by putting acoustic um, emission sensors on your rock, and basically you get little seismic signals just as you would. Um, from, from little earthquakes and you can use those to determine when something is viscous, something's brittle and when something's transitional. So actually if you look back on, I don't know if I'd actually be able to go all the way back, um, but my slide that had on the, sorry, these ones. Um, so no, I didn't have acoustic emission sensors on my rocks, but um, there's very similar experiments done on glass that show when you have um, curves like these ones here instead of these peaks when they kind of slowly drop off. Acoustic emissions are telling us actually that's a transitional behaviour. So actually these, these rocks here, they plot on the transitional point. So um, we can use that, that kind of information of telling us like, um, like acoustic emissions can tell us like when that's going to happen essentially. So you can kind of predict from those acoustic emissions when something's going to break because you have a little um, precursory information. So yes and no. Not from my experiments, but from experiments like mine, yeah. And I think there was just one, one more question over there, please. Oh, great talk again. Um, when you're selecting samples for these experiments, is it, is it a case of, because obviously volcanoes are going to produce you know, andesites, daysites, rhyolites. Uh, so what kind of span on rock type uh, and controlling sort of minerals and crystallinity and sort of ground mass grain size and things like that? So how much do those other parameters come into play when setting up for these experiments? And then what's its implication for that? for the end products of, of the damage it may cause? Well, the idea of using the mountains and rock itself, I mean, you can use any rock. The, the perfect rock would be something that changes just one parameter so that we can see how that one parameter would affect conditions. So with the Unzen rock, in this case, our crystallinity uh, doesn't really vary over the samples that I've chosen. Um, it's porosity that varies. So that would be the, the kind of perfect rock. But if you have um, a rock that varies its crystal content and keeps its porosity content, that would also be another perfect rock for experiments like this. Essentially, you're just looking for parameters, like one thing that varies. And if you have a very complex rock, so if I had crystallinity varying and porosity varying, then I wouldn't really be able to tell you what, what was affecting the results, essentially. Um, and that's 
essentially why I have mass synthetic samples because with them I can I know exactly what's in them and I can take them to the synchrotron, I can scan them and I can do all sorts with them. But with the natural rocks you can't really do that because the density contrast between minerals and, and melt isn't isn't huge, so you can't see that in the synchrotron. So you essentially work one variable and then pass cross over to the next one to sort of see the relationship between that and the sort of stuff you're working with. Exactly. Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's great. Um, Thanks. I think now we're going to move on to the <coughs> next section of this, um, this session, and this will be the posters. <laughs>